Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Greg Gilligan. I'm the communications director here at RVA 757 Connects. And we have a really exciting program to talk about the, continuing to talk about the growing digital infrastructure that's taking place in Hampton Roads. Today, we're gonna give you an inside look at the new regional fiber ring that will bring faster and more reliable internet service to Hampton Roads. Uh, first, I wanna let you know, and here's kind of the, what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna, and I'm gonna introduce one of our, our uh, sponsors. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what RV757 Connects is doing, and then we'll get to the heart of the, the program, and then we'll follow up with some questions and answers and some, what, some next step. I wanna let everybody know that uh, we are recording this session, and this will be posted on our website, uh, rva757connects.com uh, sometime in the next week or so. And also, if you have any questions, please uh, submit them to me using the chat function uh, in Zoom. RVA757Connects is a nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations. One of our corporate sponsors is the Riverside Health System, which is based in Newport News, and they operate uh, four acute care hospitals, among other things, Riverside Doctors Hospital in Williamsburg, Riverside Regional Medical Center in Newport News, the Riverside Shore Memorial Hospital, and Riverside Walter Reed Hospital in Gloucester. So we want, I really wanna thank uh, <coughs> Riverside Health System for sponsoring today's uh, Virtual Innovation Spotlight. With us today is Dr. Ross Younger. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Riverside Health System. Dr. Younger received uh, his degrees in biomedical and electrical engineering from Duke University, he received a medicine degree from the University of Virginia, and a master's of business administration and certificate in health sector uh, management from the Fuqua School there uh, at Duke University. He received his training as a head neck surgery at Eastern uh, Virginia Medical School and has practiced uh, with the ear, nose, and throat physicians, uh, surgeons, uh, from 2000 until 2013. In 2013, he took a full-time uh, role at Riverside. He now serves in multiple roles in the health system, including di Director of Medical Informa Informatics, Chief um, Medical Information Officer, Associate Chief Information Officer, and Physician Champion for Riverside's EPIC implementation. He's responsible for improving communications between clinicians and information systems personnel to facilitate the implementation, adoption, maintenance, and integration of Riverside's major clinical information systems. So let me uh, let me let uh, Dr. Younger uh, speak for for a few moments. And Dr. Younger, thank you again uh, for uh, Riverside Health System sponsoring today's program. Thank you, Greg, um, and uh, you know really appreciative that you're giving Riverside the opportunity to sponsor the virtual innovation spotlight and uh, allow us to introduce Riverside Health System uh, to the viewers. Um, you know, as mentioned, I'm, I, you know, I've been a long uh, resident of the Hampton Roads community, kind of coming uh, to Eastern Virginia Medical School um, in 1994 and, um, and staying in the region um, uh, across a variety of um, uh, pursuits. Um, Riverside, um, as mentioned, is a um, integrated health system, not-for-profit, uh, you know, providing about two and a half million services across the region and employing over 9,000 team members. Uh, we've been serving the region since 1915 and are guided by our mission to care for others as we would care for those we love. In addition to the four acute care hospitals that Greg mentioned, uh, we have a, a new hospital uh, that we will build in the Isle of Wight region. Um, we operate a behavioral health hospital, a physical uh, rehabilitation hospital and critical illness recovery hospital in partnership with Select Medical. Uh, we have a medical group of over 700 provide, you know, doctors and advanced practice providers. Um, Riverside is one of the few health systems that kind of owns the continuum of care. Um, in addition, you know, to our acute care and ambulatory facilities, we operate six nursing homes, uh, six assisted living communities, uh, two life pan communities, and um, offer home health, hospice, and palliative care services. Um, 
outside of our healthcare services, we also are extremely involved in educating the community with our College of Health Careers and uh, four medical residency programs. So as a health system, we're extremely excited to hear about the Southside Fiber Ring and the new application for, I believe it's termed the, the Peninsula Connect Fiber Ring. Um, broad access to high-speed internet is essential, uh, not only in connecting providers um, with our patients, but um, also in expanding new care models such as telehealth, remote patient monitoring, and developing models such as hospital at home. Uh, at Riverside, we do a tremendous job connecting uh, with about 60% of our patients electronically through our portal um, and web services, but uh, affordable and accessible access must be made possible across all regions, uh, including remote and um, underserved populations if we're gonna succeed in our goal and better health outcomes across all of Hampton Roads. So thank you again for including Riverside, and I look forward to hearing more about the regional fiber ring. Great, thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, uh, the insight that you provided. Let me uh, go back to, let's see here. Hopefully, I'll go back. Uh, one second here. There we go. So let me give you a quick update on, on what's going on with RV757 Connects. You know, we are an organization that's bringing the power of of convening, connecting, and collaborating to uh, the mega region from Richmond to Hampton Roads to ensure that there's a future economic growth and prosperity for everyone in the region uh, that we call the I-64 Innovation Corridor. As you can see, we're pursuing a lot of different uh, priorities. One of those priorities is trying to create a uh, strategic plan uh, to get a designation for the next global internet hub. Uh, we need the strategic plan to make this happen. Um, we've got so many different assets here in the mega region. We have the three uh, subsea cables that are coming in uh, to Virginia Beach, and those cables go right up Interstate 64, basically, to two major data centers. One is the QTS um, data center. Uh, that's the fourth largest, the world's fourth largest data center. And next door to that is the Meta, Meta which is Facebook's parent company, their data center, which they're investing something like more than a million billion dollars. Uh, and QTS is also expanding their facility as well. If you want to learn a little bit more about what's happening there, last month we had a, a webinar on that topic, and you can go to our website and you can see the story as well as a uh, video that uh, we had to re recorded from that particular webinar. Um, you know, the whole reason why we got one of the, the, the Global Internet Hub initiative was one of the findings that we've learned from the I-64 Innovation Quarter Opportunity Study that was conducted last year that was funded in part by a Go Virginia grant. So again, we thank Go Virginia for doing that. You can check out the full report if you're interested in seeing it at our, at the, at, uh, our website at, w, at RVA 757 Connects. Uh, when you have a chance, check it out. We've started the planning process for, for all of uh, what we're doing with the Global Internet Hub strategic plan. We established a strategic planning process that will take us through most of the rest of the year. We're, we've, we've now had uh, three meetings. We're at well, the fourth one later this month. Um, and you can see this is the meeting that we had in Williamsburg at the end of August. Uh, we had more than 40 people uh, attending that particular uh, meeting, which was a great turnout from, from uh, it's some more pictures there that we had. You know, so who's on who, who's who's uh, on this uh, committee, the steering committee? We've got companies from the likes of Bank of America and CarMax. We've got digital infrastructure firms like Meta, which I mentioned is Facebook's parent company. We have the Pixel Factory. We have subsea cable owners. We have broadband firms. We have cyber companies, uh, as well as those representing utilities and planning agencies and chambers, economic development entities in the military. Um, the strategic planning initiative received a hundred thousand dollar grant from go virginia region four and region five and we also received additional funding from these various companies uh, here these entities dominion energy Morocco county virginia beach hampton roads alliance old dominion university and dragonfly group we created a global internet hub website uh globalinternethub.org website this is not only for the project, but it's also a repository for all of the research and resources that we have pulled together for this particular project. 
anyone could go to that um, that site. As all part of our, our effort to kind of educate the uh, the public about the digital assets are here in the, in the uh, mega region as well as the global internet hub, we encourage the uh, Richmond Times Dispatch to create a full page infographics as a part of its uh, part of the newspaper's insights section on Saturday, September 24th. You can see that here. You can also, the infographic focused on, on how the subsea cables are coming up shore in Virginia Beach and how they connect to the various data centers. If you want, you can go to the, the Time Dispatch website, you can see it, or you can go to our website and there's a link there as well. So today's topic, um, you know, all this talk about the Global Internet Hub designation brings us to today's webinar on regional fiber network ring that will bring that faster, more reliable service to Hampton Roads. Five Hampton Road cities, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Portsmouth, Norfolk, and Suffolk have joined forces to build this fiber, the first phase of this fiber ring. Uh, future phases will include eventually connecting all 17 uh, cities and, and uh, counties, in, uh, including Southampton, Isle of Wight, as well as those on the peninsula. When we turn to our speakers, uh, if anyone's from the Richmond area, uh, you may remember Bob Crum uh, used to be the executive director of what was then called Richmond Regional Planning District Commission, now called Plan RVA. Bob, um, I've known for years, and he's the executive director now at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission and the Hampton Roads Transportation Organization. He joined those agencies as executive director in July of 2015. We have also with us is Stephen DeBerry. Stephen is the executive director of the Southside uh, Network Authority. This is the entity that was created to, is responsible for creating the fully integrated fiber network that we're talking about. He has held role, he's held that role since June of 2020. And before that, he served as the chief information officer for the city of uh, Norfolk for nearly five years. So before I turn it over, just to remind anyone, if you have questions, please use the chat function. And I'm going to now turn everything over to Bob Trump and Steve DeBerry. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Greg. Uh, first off, just the sound check, Greg, everything coming through okay? Excellent. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's our honor to uh, be before you today to share a little bit of information about the things that we're doing in Hampton Roads and our our 757 region as we uh, build out our regional fiber network. And um, it's, it's, it's a really good time to do this because we've been, um, we've been busy, we've been making a lot of progress and Stephen and I have a, a, a lot of information we're excited to share with you today. I would like to pause a moment and thank our sponsor Riverside, uh, and Mr. Younger for making this a, a opportunity available today. Thank, thank you very much. And, for those of you that I got to work with in, Re in Richmond, it's good to be able to um, uh, connect with you again. So I'm gonna go ahead, uh, Greg, and share screen here. And we'll keep our um, fingers crossed here. But Greg, did that come up okay? Yes, it's all, all right. right. All right, so we should be full screen now, correct? All right, excellent. All right, well, uh, the first thing that's really evolved over the last couple of months is what started as a concept for a ring has really become more of a regional fiber network. And um, we've um, been able to move some things a little quicker than we thought. And I'm um, really, really excited to share that information with, with, with you today. Uh, you all know the start of this story. And um, I, I um, laugh sometimes because back uh, when the IT people came to me uh, four or five, six years ago, people like Stephen DeBerry, who said, Bob, you know, these subsea cables landing in Virginia Beach are just an incredible uh, opportunity for the Hampton Roads region. Um, you know, at first as a community planner, that this was not necessarily my lane. And I, it took uh, people like Stephen and, and um, other IT managers in the region to, to really help me understand. And, and, and you, I, I think, uh, know the opportunity so, so well. This is some of the fastest uh, fiber service, internet service on the East Coast. Uh, as as Greg outlined, it was in can the you paper. Switch to a presenter mode? Right now, I see two screens. Um, so if you uh, just change your display setting. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Greg. It's not in a presenter mode right now. You know what I see is a two slides right now. Oh, my apologies. I thought I was. So let me let me try that again. 
Um, if you could hold a second, let me get somebody to help me here real quick. All right, we'll get this taken care of in a second, guys. Yeah. All right, how's that? Better? It's the same way as you had it before. It's showing same the same way as before. Let's try just, to well, Bob, just, 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 hey, Bob, if you hit display settings at the top. Yep. Oh. USA, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. That's that's better. Can you see it? it? If, it's, yeah. if it's on the tree, if, if it's on the uh, right. teach, let's get it. That that was on me. I think I had the uh, screen wrong. So how's that? Is that oh, yeah. Do you have USA? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for that heads up. My my apologies. Uh, so, so again, you know, back to the opportunity here. Fast broadband okay, internet speeds. The, the double. For the time being. I'm sorry, is that still not yeah, coming across okay? Part, yeah. Yeah. Greg, I'm sorry, I'm not able to yeah, hear you. You're good, thank you. Someone was, we, we muted the person, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, you know, what, what our plan was here was how do we, how do we take advantage of these incredible fiber internet speeds and um, really offload this ultra fast um, opportunity, this network into the Hampton Roads region uh, to not only improve our quality of life, to create a job opportunity, uh, to provide more cost effective and more reliable broadband service in our region, and, and really use this as an economic driver. So we had a number of conversations at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. We formed a local uh, broadband task force and generally came up with this uh, conceptual plan. Um, our plan was that we would interconnect with these subsea cables in Virginia Beach and build out a regionally interconnected fiber network. This map is very conceptual, it goes back several years, but the concept was that we would start with a fiber ring on the south side uh, that would interconnect our major five south side cities, um, that we would then move through our tunnels to the peninsula and do a complementary ring on the peninsula, and, and then move uh, to the southwest. Uh, our, um, our region became very excited about this possibility, and we were really excited that all 17 of our local governments through the HRPDC voted to, to endorse this concept. So after the plan was accepted, that's when, when we got started. So the first thing we did was a number of design uh, studies, and um, with the leadership of Virginia Beach and Norfolk and Portsmouth and Suffolk and Chesapeake, our five south side cities started with complete, completing the design for the routing of our fiber network on the south side. Uh, that work was done in two phases. We started with a 30% design study, then we uh, came back and um, got funding from the same five south side cities to do additional design work that got us up to about a 70% level, which got us to the point where we could start construction if we could secure the construction money. Now, uh, one thing that's uh, really important guiding philosophy is um, that our regional network ring is going to enable not compete. Uh, we don't do our broadband authority, which our localities have formed to guide this effort. And Stephen is the first executive director of that authority. We don't view us as providing that last mile service. What we want to do is we're going to build the middle mile dark fiber and we're going to attract in as many internet service providers as possible to ride that fiber. And then they will work to uh, provide that, ride the fast ring, and then uh, go ahead and provide that last mile service to our homes, residents, and businesses. And we'll, we'll talk a little more about that later. So think, think of our fiber network 
um, as the national highway system, if you will, right? We are building the information highway and we want these service providers to come in and ride our highway and provide this ultra fast uh, fiber service in, into our region, in, into our communities, homes and businesses, educational institutions, governments, uh, et, et cetera. Now, um, when we got the um, when we got that design done, that I'll go back a slide. This uh, South Side Fiber Wing, we um, came up with a cost estimate to build it at twenty four million dollars. Um, what happened is our five South Side cities um, they agreed to divide that cost equally, and each of them uh, contributed five million dollars uh, to our broadband authority to fund the construction of this South Side Fiber Ring. So what's happened this year is, is really exciting. We've been throwing a lot of dirt. <laughs> so uh, since April, we've had three um, pretty significant groundbreakings in the south side of Hampton Roads that celebrated the beginning of the construction of over 3,000 linear miles of fiber on the south side alone. And, um, and we're really excited about that. And uh, we're also equally as excited. Uh, just last week, we hit send on a federal application that's gonna take the South Side Fiber. And um, if we're successful, it'll be a $45 million project that will extend the fiber through the Monitor Merrimack Bridge Tunnel, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, and create a companion uh, piece uh, uh, network on the peninsula. So we will have basically our, um, our pretty much our entire HRPDC footprint um, will be served and have access to these subsea cables. So the first groundbreaking that we did was on April the 6th. Um, these are, uh, this is Stevens board. Uh, this is the Southside Network Authority. We are out at the cable landing station. Uh, we were out in corporate landing uh, park in Virginia beach. Um, but really an exciting day to celebrate the groundbreaking of the first phase of our network, which is the South Side Fiber Ring. Uh, then we fast forward to July 14th um, on what I think had to be one of the hottest days of the summer, but um, we, we made our way through it. Um, the HRPDC, and I believe, and I know one of our planners on here who did so much work on this, John Harbin is with us today, but we were really excited. This is a $37 million project um, that takes the fiber and moves it out to Western Suffolk, Isle of Wight County and Southampton County. Uh, this one will actually provide last mile service. And we had a really uh, fantastic celebration there. We were able to get grant funding uh, through the Virginia uh, Body Program, uh, which is a state funding for, program for broadband and fiber. So. We were really, really excited uh, about this uh, grant, this day, and, and this opportunity. So the other thing that's really started to happen now is the fiber network that we're building regionally is turning into a catalyst. And what I mean by that is we now have local governments that know where the regional network's going to be. So what they're starting to do is they're starting to build out local fiber networks that will connect to the regional ring. And uh, just to give you an, ex an example, on September the 15th, we had our third groundbreaking, but this is the city of Chesapeake, Chesapeake Connects. So they uh, broke ground on their, their local fiber network that's gonna plug into our regional uh, ring. So, this is really a situation where you have the region, you have local governments all working together. Virginia Beach has done the same thing. Portsmouth has done the same thing. This is Chesapeake celebration. They're starting construction. So we're, we're really moving along as we build out this interconnected uh, regional network in, in Hampton Roads. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about um, what our uh, digital highway is gonna look like. Sure, great. Hey, thanks, uh, Bob. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, it's really been a pleasure working with Bob the last two years on this. He, and he mentioned uh, the fact that we were building a, a national highway uh, system. Uh, our digital system for Southside Network Authority will really consist uh, initial construction of three uh, two-inch conduits around the perimeter of the 119-mile fiber ring. Uh, we're going to initially uh, 
uh, pull 288 strands of fiber through the uh, first conduit. Uh, that leaves us uh, two additional conduits that can hold up to 864 strands of fiber in each for total uh, possibility of over 2,000 strands of fiber. Obviously, this is a generational project, a 40-year project, and we believe we've built enough capacity uh, to handle uh, the needs for the next 40 years as we move forward. Um, next slide. All right, so, it be, and I'm gonna talk a little more uh, about some of our goals and vision and use of this fiber network and, and then go back to Steve for more technical information. But um, real quick, um, you know, really our goal is to be known as the, the 757 be in that smart region where we can use our technology to address not only our most significant challenges, but opportunities. And, um, you know, we, we, have, we have some challenges that we're dealing with, sea level rise and recurrent flooding. Um, we, we continue to, um, you know, build and strengthen our regional emergency communication system. Transportation, we're making over $5 billion investment, all paid for with local money from our local governments to really build the largest interstate highway construction program in the country. Uh, autonomous vehicles and remote learning and teleworking and, you know, supporting our colleges and universities and our high attracting high tech companies and really creating that technology ecosystem. These are things that we think are a huge opportunity for us through this regional fiber network. Um, and, and, and just some uses in terms of what we can do with our, our smart region approach. Obviously, interoperability, we're still with 17 local governments. Um, being able to communicate quickly, efficiently, the, this is the type of fiber backbone that we're building. Uh, obviously, here in, in the 757, the last 48 hours have been, have been challenging for us. Fortunately, not as bad as we thought it might be, but you know, helping our region navigate flooding and sea level rise is another huge opportunity. And we've already launched a regional um, uh, sensor network that allows us to monitor uh, water levels and allows us to be able to connect to things like ways and other um, uh, communication devices to help our motorists and our residents understand where it's safe to drive and where it isn't. And really to be able to use these sensors to help us in our planning for, for recurrent flooding and sea level rise. We all know autonomous vehicles are a wave of the future and it's really this type of a uh, fiber network that's going to provide the um, tech, technological uh, foundation for us to, to, to be able to operate autonomous vehicles or think about smart transportation options. Um, at the end of the day, we wanna use this fiber network to help all 17 of our localities in ways that helps them advance their own priorities, their initiatives and their visions. Of course, the other thing is um, in the 757, we really think our network is gonna help us grow industries in the 757. And, you know, Greg and others, I, I know we talk a lot about data centers, right? Um, and data centers are gonna be important, but we also think that we can use this as an economic recruitment tool that we're giving our Hampton Roads Alliance and our local economic development departments just another tool as they attract businesses. And we think about, um, just as talked about at the last global internet hub meeting, um, you know, financial services, data transfer and storage, cybersecurity, um, medical and biosciences, think about modeling companies and simulation companies. We really think we're gonna be able to provide the type of fast, um, reliable, fiber here and, and, and broadband that can really support these businesses and hopefully create a good environment and ecosystem for them to want to come call um, the 757 home. So Steve, why don't you talk a little bit about our pathway, um, sort of where we've been and, and where we're going with, with our plans. Sure, sure. Thanks, Bob. So, so this is a busy slide, but I think what we want to present here is that we've worked hard to develop a sense of urgency. Um, you know, five years goes by pretty fast, and we heard briefings at our last strategic board where it's taking anywhere from three to five years to build infrastructure necessary to run data centers. So we've, we've kept our, uh, our foot on the gas pedal. As, as Bob mentioned, the, the Southside Network Authority was actually formed in, in November of 2019 after a, 
you know, a number of individual efforts by cities and CIOs working uh, together. Um, uh, back about uh, July of 2020, we actually hired a firm, uh, Columbia Telecommunications, uh, who is serving as our, our engineering architect. They helped us, as Bob mentioned earlier, go from a 30% design to roughly an 80% design, which would allow us to get uh, good price and cost estimates uh, for construction. Uh, you know, setting up an entity like this requires a lot of governance, as you know, and, and with it working within state and federal, federal guidelines. So we spent a lot of time getting uh, that part uh, of, of the process uh, right. Um, we still had a dilemma. We were looking at a 24 to $25 million project and how would the five Southside cities fund this? And so we, uh, after consultation with CTC, we really went, went down a dual path strategy where we went out with, with basically uh, two requests for procurement. One was uh, assuming that we would uh, get the money either through grants or through um, bond, bonds from the cities. Uh, we put out a construction contract. Uh, simultaneously to that, we also put out a uh, private partnership uh, RP, uh, request for procurement to see if there were industry partners who would be interested in funding all or part of that, of the fiber ring, and at the same time, uh, perhaps manage it for us. Well, as you all know, COVID hit, which changed the landscape of, of, um, of, of IT, uh, more people working at home, uh, and we were able to actually leverage uh, federally funded uh, uh, American Rescue uh, Act money. The five cities were able to uh, take that money and develop internal strategies to better leverage uh, their money. So uh, there are you know, various colors of money that helped uh, uh, provide the $25 million that Bob uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, we were really excited in March of, uh, and so, so long story short, we obviously uh, decided to go down the construction route where we would, uh, we would own the fiber ring because we thought that would provide uh, more leverage and we would have, um, taking care of the sunk cost of construction that we think would allow us to, again, to uh, enhance competition uh, in the area by taking away some of those barriers of construction costs and perhaps having uh, you know, even smaller I internet service providers uh, uh, come in, into the region. Uh, we've been simultaneously, uh, because of the P3 effort that I mentioned, negotiating with a local company, uh, Global Technical uh, Systems, who we are looking at potential of leasing fiber uh, to them, having them um, market and, um, and maintain that portion um, of, of the fiber ring. And really excited now that we're looking at mid-October, just a couple of three weeks out of, of actually doing the first directional bores uh, for just to really kickstart the construction process. Okay. So just a quick recap again of, of construction, current and planned uh, actual, um, our A&E on, on, on board uh, CTC has completed all final survey action for the 119 miles. Um, as Bob said, um, you know, we have a participation agreement where we uh, develop share, shares for each of the cities. Um, we've signed uh, individual mass release agreements, or, you know, better known as right of way agreements with all five cities. Uh, we have conduit in hand. Uh, we expect fiber to be delivered early uh, calendar year 23, which is really a, a feat in itself. If you look at many projects, they're looking at 18 months out for, for uh, fiber. Our construction company, Danella, has been very successful in uh, helping uh, us get that, that fiber. Um, we've obviously, in a project this, this size, we've had conversations with the uh, State Department of Environmental Quality, Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, other regulatory uh, agencies. And as I said earlier, uh, Danella will uh, begin construction here in two or three weeks, and, and that's when the ex excitement and uh, fun really begins. Next slide. And just a just a recap, we I talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, the negotiations that we're, that we're uh, conducting with uh, GTS, a, a local firm, is really a sort of a hybrid P3 uh, model. Uh, we hope to be getting very close to some type of agreement with them. Uh, we've uh, captured our, both sides' uh, positions in terms of term sheets, and, and we have a preliminary uh, interim agreement um, that's completed. 
a little bit more work to do, and then we'll pre hopefully present that to our board uh, next Friday at our next scheduled board meeting. Okay, next slide. So um, earlier, Dr. Younger talked about the potential for uh, another success story um, over on the on the peninsula. As Bob said, um, phases two and three of our project would be to um, uh, connect to the peninsula uh, via t the two major uh, uh, tunnels while uh, providing connectivity to the cities on the uh, on the peninsula. So um, we worked uh, with the uh, pen peninsula, uh, Newport News and Hampton did a lot of up and down lifting. This was a, a six week, uh, 24 hour day uh, process just to get this grant in. It was successfully uh, submitted on September 30th. And the model that Newport News and Hampton built is very similar to the Southside model where they are you know, we're in effect connecting a southern part of the peninsula first, uh, the cities of Newport New News and Hampton, looking at higher education, economic development, unserved and underserved areas. And the neat thing is um, a significant cost, as you are aware, getting across tunnels. This grant would include the uh, cost for connecting uh, via the two tunnels. So we would actually, if we are successful in this grant, we'll have completed uh, phases one could complete phases one, two, and three, and, and Bob's already done good work out in the western part of the region uh, with the VADI grant that would uh, serve the, the jump start, start that. So we continue to work with uh, Virginia DHCD. Um, you know, we'd like, we think we have a great project that, that, that they can learn from and that we can participate in. We'll continue to look at the possibility of VADI grants and uh, align those efforts where appropriate. Bob, that's, that's what I've got. Thanks. All right, excellent. Well, um, Greg, I'm just going to wrap up with maybe a, just a few high-level thoughts about this. But, um, you know, we, we think um, here in the 757 and obviously in the RVA as well that we have a quality of life that is unparalleled. And we really think our quality of life can help attract remote workers that, as we all know, People can live about anywhere they want to today and, and, and work remotely. But um, we really think our regional network, um, our fiber network can help support them. We think we can try to provide the type of, of an ecosystem here that is going to um, really make this an attractive area for people to be able to locate and to be able to telework uh, to other markers, markets if they would like to. Um, it, Providing this ultra fast fiber, uh, we think just creates us incredible opportunities that are even more significant um, with COVID. And, you know, I think you've probably all seen these things, but um, before COVID-19, our distributed workforce or telework um, was growing and we thought it would be at about 50% by 2030. But what we know post COVID that it's probably gonna reach 50% by 2025. Right. Um, we, we've learned that um, there's a lot of ways that companies and organizations can work more efficiently or be able to work just as efficiently in, in a remote environment. But, and, and even more so, um, we really think our regional fiber network is going to help support our military. We've been told by the Navy that the Navy would like to see a third of their local workforce uh, teleworking. Um, and we really believe that if um, BRAC ever returns, um, that if we're able to provide this type of ultra fast regional fiber network, that it can only help us in our efforts to really um, maintain the military as, as a key part of our, of our community. Um, really what we're trying to do is future-proof the 757. And I, I just wanna pause here and say, there's just been so many players involved in this, and it's just been so incredibly exciting. Um, you know, the partners here, um, our 17 local governments through the PDC have all weighed in unanimously in support of this effort. And they weighed in not only with their vote, but with, with, their, with their money as well. Um, I, I just did a quick add up. Um, the Southside uh, Fiber Ring was funded with a $25 million investment by the five Southside cities. Uh, the body grant, we were fortunate to get monies out in Southampton and Western Suffolk and um, out of White Counties. Mm -hmm. um, 
we got $20 million in grant money, but in round numbers, about 15 million of those monies were provided by those three local governments. And the federal grant that we just submitted last week had $15 million of local match money in it. So right now we have over $55 million of local match money coming from these local governments as we move forward uh, with, with, with this project. So it's really been great to, to see that regional cooperation. And even beyond our local governments, um, Stephen and I have had a number of meetings with VDOT. Um, and, um, you know, as we say, okay, as we rebuild the HRBT project, we, we have that project occurring right now with the funded by our local money. Um, you know, VDOT's been incredibly cooperative of helping us with the most efficient way to get through the HRBT with this fiber, the most efficient way to get through the Monitor Merrimack Memorial Bridge Tunnel with this fiber. Uh, that they've been super cooperative and very helpful. Um, even private sectors, the ERC tunnels um, down in Portsmouth that we have to go through the move from Norfolk through Portsmouth. Um, they've been incredibly cooperative. We've had cooperation from the Department of Housing and Community Development. So um, we're just really, really excited about everyone that's contributed to, 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 the, to this project and to this effort. You know, what's interesting is um, this is a model that a lot of people are using, uh, publicly coordinated, middle mile dark fiber systems. Um, there's, these networks are happening all over the country. And, um, you know, I think that what we've been trying to do is not recreate, reinvent the wheel, but really use a process and, a, and an effort that, that's worked in other places. Um, we were really excited. Um, we, our project was recognized nationally. Um, it was a few years back when we first conceived this, but uh, we were um, out of 80 project submissions, um, selected the uh, Smart Infrastructure Challenge winner uh, that year. And we were just at the planning phases then, uh, but it's certainly exciting to see us here in 2022, really moving forward with, with construction of, of this fiber network. So, Greg, uh, my apologies for my snafu at the beginning there, but hopefully we got through it okay. And um, I'd like to turn it back over to you and uh, look forward to, um, I'll stop share a second so we can get us all back up in the screen and look forward to um, responding to any questions that your audience might have. Yeah, Bob and Stephen, that was that was just fascinating to, to hear about all that you all are doing down there. Let me just ask, let me start off, I ask a practical question. So let's say I live either in a house or an apartment down, let's say Chesapeake or in, in Norfolk or, or Virginia Beach. Um, do I call Stephen up and I tap into the, to the fiber ring that way? How, how does it work practically for, for a resident or, or for business? So I think uh, from a practical standpoint, as Bob mentioned, uh, we're a, a middle mile dark fiber. Um, we would be partnering with uh, ISPs and other uh, entities. Um, and I mentioned GTS as a potential partner who would actually build out last mile to uh, businesses and residents. Um, and then it's it becomes even better in that uh, the cities are building out their own infrastructure, which provide additional highway. So a business could actually connect to, for instance, a Chesapeake a city ring could, could, could then connect to the uh, Southside Network Authority ring and have access to the transatlantic cables or, or any other international uh, internet hub, if you, if you would. So it would be, it would be driven by business. We, we're in the business of leasing fiber. We'll be looking for partners who are gonna provide that last mile. And that process is underway, Greg, as Stephen mentioned with our current negotiations that, that we're involved in. Um, but at the end of the day, we want as many internet service providers as possible here. And um, we're, we're gonna, um, we think there's, there's already great interest and uh, the ride this network and, um, and, and provide that. Think about those uh, last mile providers. If we're the interstate highway system, they're sort of like the local roads, right? That are getting out into the neighborhoods and, and tapping into our fiber network and then spreading that out into local homes, businesses, et cetera. Good, so we have a, we have a question from uh, Scott Brown from uh, Pixel Factory. Uh, Scott wants to know, have an agreement been signed with Microsoft or Facebook or Telexis or any discussions? And will this fiber ring be inside the cable landing station? 
So there are ongoing discussions, many protected by uh, NDA, both ourselves and potential uh, partners. Uh, but as we said earlier, we would uh, be able to connect uh, to the uh, regional fiber ring to the transatlantic cables. We have a, another question. Um, earlier in the presentation, you said one of the key customers are the local ISPs, the internet service providers. So is Cox or Verizon committed to using this fiber once it's created? Once we uh, finish the construction of the fiber ring, our next step would be to release uh, a call for uh, proposals and, and interests in riding, riding the ring. So um, we believe there's going to be, uh, Stephen and I have entertained a number of phone calls from ISPs, and we believe there's going to be a lot of great interest in, 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 riding, in riding the ring. Uh, we can't get specific names yet because we, we need the asset built before we can release that RFP. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, um, we're really excited of, of, and think there's going to be significant interest. Stephen, anything you want to add to that? No, and I think, as, as you all know, there's a process that, we would, that, that ISPs go through. They, uh, they, they approach cities and have franch, uh, formal franchise agreements. So there, there's a lot of work that has to be done. But again, we've got to have a product in the ground uh, to start that process. Um, and, and Tim also asked a, a, a question relating to that also. He said his prior understanding was that the established ISPs had plenty of back-end fiber and preferred to own their own fiber infrastructure. So I, let me just say this. I mean, I, 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 I would say that could, could be a true statement. I think that um, when we talk about internet service providers, it could be large carriers, but it most likely will be uh, smaller carriers who are interested in a project like this. And by taking on the capital uh, portion up front, we've, we've actually uh, helped their business model. So I would say my experience has been that, uh, that many times the larger carriers want to, their business model is to use their own fiber background backbone. Thanks. So Bob, well, let me ask you this, you know, you used to be up here in Richmond and, and you have an uh, understanding of, of what's happening down there with this fiber. Could this be, could, could the Richmond region get this or like the Fredericksburg area? Could this happen elsewhere? I guess is my question. And could we tap, could, could the Richmond region do the same thing if its localities all got together? Sure, I, I think absolutely. I think as, as you're aware, you already are tapped into the subsea cables in Henrico County. Um, so the fiber is up 64. Um, it, it is into Richmond. Um, and, you know, there could be opportunities if, if the very, if other regions saw this as beneficial to them um, to, to do the same type of model. Absolutely. So do we have uh, any questions from any of the uh, folks that are on the, the webinar today? Just want to make sure, give everyone an opp opportunity to be able to ask questions. So, so, so Bob and, and Stephen, let me ask you, um, I guess why do this? Why, why go through the, the expense of doing something like this? What was the impetus for, for creating a, a fiber ring? Is it so that you can become a smart locality or you know, or to, to be able to help uh, ISPs? What was, what was the, the, the rationale behind it all? So at, at the outset, I, I think a couple of things, Greg. Um, I think first off, we were a region that um, paid an awful lot yeah, compared to other peer regions, um, we, we have very expensive service. Um, we had um, limited options. And, um, and, and some were concerned about speeds in some geographic areas. And then we have other areas of our region that are underserved, right? And, um, and that's not, and, and I want to stress, that's not a negative towards the business sector. There's just some places where you just don't get the business case model to be able to provide the service, right? But due to a lack of density or other things. I think we have other areas I can tell you that you can go, um, you know, you, you can go to public libraries in the evening and um, you see the parking lot for vehicles and children have their Chromebooks and they're doing homework in the cars and parking lots in the evening because they don't have internet at home, right? 
And then I think on top of all that, it really stressed the system during COVID even more, right? With remote work and remote learning, et cetera. And, and, and then in addition, I, I think our local governments took a look at this just um, almost generational opportunities of these incredible subsea cables landing here and saying, you know, we completely want everybody to be able to tap into it, but we didn't want Hampton Roads to be a pass-through region, right? And we were really interested to say, how could we take, how could we take um, this ultra-fast fiber and off-ramp it in Hampton Roads? And then you drape over top of all of that, and um, I, I, it's well documented. Well documented. If you look back the last twelve to fifteen years, we have just not recovered as quick as other metropolitan regions um, uh, to the economic downturn. And um, I, I think, with collectively, when you put all that together and ask the question, you know, could could this fiber, could this broadband be a contributing factor, not alone, but with everything else we're doing, right? All the $5.8 billion of transportation investments, the work we're doing to cooperate around getting our economic development sites uh, ready, the work that we're doing around um, taking advantage to seize offshore wind as a job creation opportunity, figuring out our flooding challenges, and then overlaying this uh, fiber network is, is another opportunity. Our, our region just really came together and said that this, this is an opportunity that we gotta be proactive and we have to seize this, seize this opportunity. So, so that, those are some of the conversations that our officials have had or, uh, around our table. And, and I would add uh, to uh, Bob really captured, I think the uh, strategic intent of the Southside Network Authority uh, but, you know, also, uh, there's a need for smaller businesses, economic development, uh, their economies of scale to a project like this. As we connect to um, Internet hotels and others, we can drive down the cost of transportation, cost of Internet uh, overhead for um, Internet access uh, programs and things like that. So I think we'll be attractive to smaller businesses. And, and as, as Bob and Stephen, as we've discussed before, this also helps attract those high tech jobs as well. Yes, one of the, uh, when I was at Norfolk uh, and actually uh, 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 SRR helped me with, a, uh, with some research. I mean, we found out obviously that 90% of the businesses uh, needed high speed internet for their, for their work, but they were paying uh, too much for too little uh, capacity. And the other complaint was we've got these major uh, institutions of higher learning who are, who are developing uh, internet skills. Norfolk State has a cybersecurity program. They work with Old Dominion on pushing big data, working with EVMS and Centera. And, and how do we keep those uh, smart young folks here? By, by providing a good environment. They can work from home. Uh, and so there, it's a win-win there. It's an issue that every internet, any city has that's, that's growing like this. Um, attracting and retaining good workers. And, and Craig, I, I know another um, critical priority uh, for the mega region is leaning support in behind Jefferson Lab um, and that incredible opportunity for bringing a high capacity supercomputer to Jefferson Lab and what that can mean for job creation. And I, I see our, my friends on here, Jim Spore and others that, that, that are working on that, and we formed a group, uh, Friends of Jeff Lab, to, to help bring regional support behind that. We're just really excited with the work that Hampton and Newport News has done um, and, and what we've been able to pull off over the last six weeks of getting an application. And if we can get that funded, we'll be able to say that we can connect um, that type of an asset to this incredible uh, infrastructure. And, um, you know, and, and, and on top of that, Steve raises such an important point, you know, our colleges and universities all along this innovation corridor, if we can, um, you know, Old Dominion University, Stephen, has been at the table with you and others since day one. Or, do you want to talk about that a little, Steve? Sure. Well, I think, you know, everyone's a potential customer, but uh, as a former CIO of Norfolk and Old Dominion, Norfolk State being right there, uh, TCC, uh, in our neighborhood, they, there's a lot of things going on with in the biomedical world, as Dr. Younger would tell you, that 
you know, pushing big data, which in uh, taking large amounts of medical data and putting it in a form that can be used for telemedicine and whatnot. I, I know that Old Dominion is working with EVMS and Centero on projects like that. So there's there's interest in a, in a number of higher education uh, institutions. Hey, um, this is Ross. If, if I could just make one other comment, I, I really applaud this effort. And um, you know, whereas all of these industries that you're mentioning have unique um, business, you know, cases and needs. Um, I think one of the critical things for healthcare, uh, where I'm really excited about this, is we not only have a need for a high functioning ISP, but as we've moved from paper records to digital records, we now have a very real demand for zero downtime. And our EHRs, the EHRs don't fail. The internet service providers fail. You know, um, we, we've had incidences where we've lost uh, connections to like uh, hospitals on the Eastern shore because lightning hit the cable on the, um, you know, the tunnel. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, you know, we, we're in a situation now where we're, we're paying uh, for redundancy at all of our hospitals and uh, medical campuses and, and the need for really low cost alternatives um, to provide that redundancy so that it doesn't matter if Cox goes down, there's a, a backup provider. Um, so, you know, this is, a, you know, I, you, you mentioned some municipal rings and education rings. I wonder if there are opportunities for healthcare rings for rapid information sharing that's uh, you know almost a micro segmentation for healthcare given our unique HIPAA you know regulations. So I, it, this is just a very exciting topic, and you know thanks for including us. Great. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Bob and Stephen. I really truly do appreciate uh, you all participating. Um, let's just finish it up here um, with. Here's, there we go, got questions and answers. So what's next? I just want to remind everyone that you can get a recorded link to this, um, this session on WR, uh, at rva757connects.com. Um, at some point, probably in about a week, we'll post it to our website. And also, if you have questions about the Global Internet Hub or want to learn about something more, go to that website. That's globalinternethub.org. Um, also, next week, a week from Thursday, we will hold Convergence 2022. This is a, an effort between the Chamber RVA, the Hampton Roads Chamber, and RVA 757 Connects. It's an interregional gathering to build awareness of what's happening in the I-64 Innovation Quarter. It's from 10 a.m. until 8.30 uh, with uh, lunch and dinner and uh, a keynote speaker. The cost is $95. If you're interested, um, send me an email. I'll send you the registration link. Next month, uh, from November the 1st, we will hold the next of our Innovation Spotlight series um, at noon. And this one will be on, the, we're gonna take a deep dive into what's happening uh, with these subsea cables that are coming ashore at Virginia Beach. They're connecting you know, these continents and countries and cities. So we're gonna really look into these, uh, these deep sea uh, cables that are coming ashore. Uh, and again, if, if you, uh, you can help us by following us, uh, suggest future topics, invite us to your business or organization um, to be able to, uh, uh, to continue growing and advance the, the cause of the RVA 757 Connects. And finally, I also wanna thank again to Riverside uh, Health System for sponsoring today's uh, Innovation Spotlight. We really do appreciate you doing that for us. And thank you all for attending as well. And we hope to see you uh, next month on November the 1st for the next Virtual Innovation Spotlight. Thank you again and have a great afternoon.